Hello, I'm Ron Bergeron, and I'm so happy that you have invited me back into your church to share with you something from the Word of God. I should offer an apology right off the bat because this is a uh, one-take recording. I have no way to edit this or take out any of the goofs or the gaffs, but I will try to make it uh, as painless as possible and try to stay uh, on target with message. You know, bullies are not a new phenomenon. People that pick on others smaller than them or less able to defend themselves are not a unusual phenomenon either throughout history. They have existed in our world since uh, the beginning. Think about when Cain bullied Abel and eventually being unable to overcome Abel's righteousness took his life. Bullies are just very common across all cultures. There's always somebody who wants to have more power over others. One of the definitions of bullying that I found is this one. It goes like this. The use of threats or coercion, or, or coercion to intimidate others. Coercion meaning trying to influence. It is the act of repeated aggressive behavior intended to hurt another person either physically or emotionally. And likewise, the, the term coercion, in case you're not sure what that means, is it is the use of intimidation or force to force someone into doing your will. So basically bullying is characterized by someone who behaves in certain ways in order to gain power over others. Defining characteristics of bullies include having a lack of empathy, for other people, not caring about how other people feel, the need to control other people, loose control of anger is another characteristic of these people, or they, they typically constantly remind others of, of their weaknesses, they pick on people that do not comply with their own expectations, they try to make others fear them or make them afraid through intimidation or threats. They might even use physical aggression to intimidate and control. And they defy anyone who would try to share or correct their power. Now, as I read that kind of long, boring list of characteristics, probably somebody comes to mind in your past that would fit that definition of what a bully is. You know, what's all this got to do with the scriptures? What's this got to do with our spiritual standing in the world. It's coming. Just be patient. Bullies come in all shapes and all sizes and all ages and they wear all types of external packaging. Uh, they could be children or husbands or wives. They could be elderly people. They could be rich people. They could be poor people. They could be wise people. They could be foolish people. They could be teenagers. They could be preachers or deacons. The characteristics are all the same for a bully. They are small-minded, evil-hearted people who want the power to control those who live around them. Sometimes they're not even people. Think about Satan and his desire to control others when he cannot uh, get his own way through other means. You might even think of bullies as an inanimate object, like for instance, the burdens that we carry around with us, the problems that we face in life, anything that might intimidate and control our lives. And when you think about things that intimidate or control our life, what comes to mind more completely than the fear of death? In fact, the scriptures say that we are held in bondage to fear because of the fact of death. All things die. But part of today's message is that we do not have to allow bullies to control our life. And they don't have to control our, our spiritual lives as well. Part of the secret of overcoming a bully is to realize that most bullies are cowards. Now on to the Bible story where we can apply some of these things. It's found uh, in Samuel, 
the gospel, uh, the gospel of Samuel, in the story of Samuel the prophet and the first uh, king of the Davidic line, King David. A little intro into the story first. We're going to encounter the people known as the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were one of the Canaanite tribes left over from Israel's conquest of the Promised Land. They were powerful, warlike people known for their expert skill in metallurgy, making armor, uh, making iron, and making weapons of war, and stronger weapons of war, stronger shields, stronger implements uh, that didn't break, were not as brittle. They were also pagan idolaters who worshipped the fish god, Dagon. They were uh, all around the Israelites, but they occupied a region that extends from the shores of the Mediterranean Sea in the west all the way to the foothills of Judea in the east. One of their most famous Philistines was Goliath. He was a Gentile, he was an idol worshipper, and he was the enemy of Israel. And that makes him the enemy of God. And Goliath was the ultimate bully. Funny, the, the word Goliath, the name of Goliath, means splendor or splendid. He was from the city of Gath, which was one of the five major cities of Philistia. It was a strategic military city on the Philippine, on, on the Philippine, on the Philistine Israel border. So the people of, the, of Gath were referred to all throughout the Bible as Gittites. The passage says that Goliath stood six cubits and a span. Now that means that Goliath was actually nine feet, nine inches tall. He was almost 10 feet tall. He wore copper armor that covered his body from his head to his toe. And he wore copper, copper body armor constructed from overlapping copper plates that resembled the scales of a fish. It says that the armor itself weighed 5,000 shekels. Translated into pounds, that's about 200 pounds of armor. He wore greaves, that is, a wrapping of copper around his legs, and the target of copper that hung between his shoulders on the back was a round piece of copper that protected his upper back and held his spear. They compare in the scriptures his, his spear to a weaver's beam, which means it was several feet long and very thick. The head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron, which is about 25 pounds. Now, you go to the gym and you pick up a 25-pound dumbbell, and you'll have an idea of how massive all of this armor and weapons were. Walking before Goliath was a soldier who would typically carry another shield to help protect Goliath from any arrows or spears launched at him by his enemies. Now, in the story, so Goliath is a very formidable soldier. Obviously, he's huge. He stands several feet taller than most of the uh, soldiers of his day. And we know that David was a small man. So, imagine David facing off against this almost 10 foot tall soldier who has been trained for war from birth. No doubt everybody who saw Goliath was afraid of him. Nobody wanted to face him in battle. He would appear to the average person unconquerable and indestructible. So Goliath challenges the Israelites to a fight. He mocks them and he calls them cowards and he demands that a soldier be sent to fight him. And he does this twice a day, every day, for 40 days. He is persistent. The reaction by Israel is one of dismay, being greatly afraid. And the word used here means to break down from fear. Just imagine breaking down from fear. This is the word dismay. The phrase greatly afraid 
also suggests that they overcome with an exceedingly great terror in fear. So, so Goliath, Goliath possesses all the trademark characteristics of a true bully. He's big, he's intimidating, he's bold, he's persistent. He basically wins before he ever swings a sword because he has made them afraid to do anything. And a lot of times that's where our defeat is. When bullies rule your life, whether it's a, an instance or a thought process or another person or a challenge, they just freeze us from doing anything. They make us afraid to do anything. You know, there are problems that arise in life that can assume power over us, just like Goliath did over the Israelites. There are people who loom large in our minds to the point where we actually fear them and what they might do to us. There are circumstances and situations that overwhelm us with their intensity. Sometimes the bullies that we face leave us not knowing what to do or where to turn. And if we're not careful, we'll let those bullies intimidate us to the point where we become too afraid to do or say anything, lest the bully attack us and make us hurt worse than we already do. If that describes your life right now, then your bully has you right where he wants you, and your bully is cruising to an easy victory. So, how is this bully defined? Back to the story. Goliath threatens Israel. He mocks them. He challenges them to send a man out to fight him to the death. And he does this 80 times over 40 days. Twice a day for 40 days. And each time he does, Israel, the nation of Israel, responds by hiding in fear from an opponent they see as unbeatable. Even their powerful leader, their king, King Saul, doesn't come out to face the giant. Fear has ruled the day in Israel. But David doesn't react that way. How was David's reaction different? And how can ours be different as we consider applying this to ourselves? It's all about the perception that David has of the problem and the solution. Some saw this bully as the opponent when they saw Goliath walk out on the field and challenge the Israelites. When Israel saw and heard Goliath, they said, surely to defy Israel has he come up to us. So they see him as an enemy who is coming up to defy Israel. And all they could see was him and them. They couldn't see beyond that about how they felt about the matter. And this so often happens with the situation that makes us fear. Suddenly, all the solutions that might normally come to mind vanish, and you're left seeing only the worst possible outcome if things went wrong, and utter destruction. Not much of a choice. The worst possible outcome, you can imagine, or utter destruction. No wonder people are frozen into doing nothing when something takes hold of them like that. And that kind of describes us in certain occasions, doesn't it? When we face one of life's bullies, there are times when we forget that the issue is bigger than us. And our primary focus is on how things make us feel. And when we do that, we miss the larger picture. Consider when those, mo when those moments come, how we can use these opportunities of fear to make us grow. That's right. How can something that negative be turned to a positive? When you have an instance in your life that is so overwhelmingly uh, filling you with fear, how can you turn that for good? Consider what Paul said. In the letter he wrote to the church in Rome, chapter 8, verses 28, 
He says this remarkable statement that should give us all a different perspective on our fears. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Now think about that for a second. All things work together for good. You mean the cancer uh, that my that my parent or my sister or my friend has, God can make that work into something good for those that are called according to his purpose, yes. You mean the loss of my income and the inability to make a decent living during this pandemic that we are all facing around the world, that can be turned for good? That's what it says. It continues on there, Romans chapter 8, uh, verses 29, it says, For whom he foreknew, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called, and them he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, he also glorified. Now let me pause for a minute there and encourage you not to get all lost in the predestination part because when we say predestined today, we have this image of what that means. That means that God has already decided before a single breath was taken who was going to be saved and who wasn't, who was going to be a Christian and who wasn't. That's not at all what predestination means. It's more as though God knew that those that chose to be his children those that choose to follow him would follow a certain pattern of behavior because we're all going to be conformed to the image of Jesus. In our hearts, in our minds, in our spirits, in our souls, we are being, we are being made more and more like Jesus through the gift and the work of the Holy Spirit that is granted to all who have been baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. They will receive the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2 says. So all of those, he has already predestined what they are going to be like and how they are going to behave. So with that in mind, think about this again. He said, those he foreknew, he also did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. So God knew in advance that we were going to be those people that become more and more like his son in the image of his son. And uh, then the rest of it makes more sense. Jesus might be the firstborn among many brethren. Jesus' attitude, Jesus' heart, his soul, his mind, his spirit is very much like those that he is going to call brothers, Christians, you and I. Those he did predestine, Christians, he also called, and those he called, he glorified. Those he justified, he glorified. So despite what it thinks, the bully in your life, the trial, the difficulty, it was sent to you to develop you, not to hurt you. It was sent to make you more like Jesus, more in the image of Jesus, which was God's goal in saving you to begin with. Now listen to me today. If that bully in your life succeeds in getting your eyes off the Lord, only then has he won. No matter what difficulty or trial you're facing, if you keep your eyes on Jesus and you keep the goal of your life to please God in mind throughout whatever difficulty you're facing, you win. You win. It's another difference that Israel, um, one difference that Israel didn't uh, make when they were looking at Goliath that can be instructive for us as we deal with the bullies in our life. And that was that they saw Goliath, they saw their bully, as an obstacle. They saw Goliath standing between them and what they wanted. They saw Goliath standing between God and what God wanted. David said, For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David didn't think that was a good way to look at it. Is, is he standing between what they want 
uh, and, and what God wants? Is Goliath an obstacle? David challenges that. He said, who is he that he should stand in our way? To him, the issue was bigger than Goliath. It was bigger than the army of Israel. It was bigger than all of them put together. To David, and this is the key, this issue was about the glory of God. Who is this that he should defy the armies of the living God? Emphasis on the living God, not the armies that he has. This was his view of faith, that as he saw Goliath opposed to God and those that God had called his own, the nation of Israel, the battle was not between him and Goliath at all. The battle wasn't even between Goliath and King Saul or the armies of Israel. The battle was between Goliath and God. Now you think about that when you apply the bullies in your life that you can't seem to overcome. Maybe, maybe this can be some instruction here from what we've just read, that the battle is not between you and giving in to that temptation. The battle is not between whether or not um, you can have things done your way or not. Maybe if you think about it in spiritual terms, the battle might be between God and, Sa and Satan, or God and evil. People are sometimes afraid to say what needs to be said, or to take a stand. You know, we need the same perspective that David had here. When we allow any bully to paralyze us with fear, we are rendered ineffective in the work of the Lord. Fear of your bullies will prevent you from saying what needs to be said. Fear of your bullies will prevent you from doing what needs to be done. And people are often afraid of what needs to be said. They're afraid to take a stand or to object. There are people who won't tell others that they're Christians because some bully in the past may have made them afraid and they don't want a bad reaction. Sad to say there are some parents who won't stand up to their children because they have raised bullies and the parents are afraid of them. There are wives who live in fear because a bully keeps them in line with verbal threats and physical violence. God forbid that a man should ever treat his wife that way. In our personal lives, the bullies we face there, the problems, the other things that come our way are obstacles to God's will being done in our life. We need to see them that way. And when we do, we are ready to see those circumstances change. You know, the sooner we realize that our bullies are opportunities for God to receive glory from our lives, the sooner we will be willing to stand up and face our bullies in the power of God. God's not glorified when I'm paralyzed with fear. He is glorified when I forget about myself, my agenda, my feelings, my wants, and concern myself with God's glory, even in the smallest of situations. Every bully in our lives is an opportunity for God to get glory from our lives. By the same token, every bully is an opportunity for us to fail. Our duty is to trust God for the power we need to stand up to the bullies we face. So, how is this bully defeated? The methods that David used to defeat Goliath, that bully, will work for you with any bully you face in your life. Notice these things that David did that we can do as well. First of all, David had courage. David says that he will fight the giant, and when he does, he is brought before the king. Now, Saul doesn't think David could do it, and he says so. But then again, neither did anyone else. I mean, after all, what does a young man who has never been proven on the field of battle know about whipping bullies, much less a 10-foot tall giant? So David tells them about two times when bullies attacked his sheep in the form of wild animals. He tells them about how he killed a lion and a bear that were threatening his 
his sheep. And this is crucial. He says there's no difference between those animals and Goliath. Now, there's a key point that whatever bully you are facing in your personal spiritual life, there have been instances previously when you saw God come through for you. And if you can link the success that God gave you in those smaller instances, you will have courage to face the bigger instance before you now. David succeeded because he was not afraid to face the bullies in his life. It's not that David didn't have fear. What matters is that he didn't let his fears stop him. You think that he didn't uh, have a little heart palpitation when he saw a 10-foot warrior bearing down on him? But David had the courage to stand up for what was right and against what was wrong. So he triumphed because he was a man of courage, number one. When the moment to face the bully come, the Lord will give you the courage. You need to stand up for him. It won't be easy to face the bullies in your life, but remember this. The Lord has promised to be with you. Hebrews chapter 13 says, I will never leave thee or forsake thee. The Lord has promised to see you through to the other side. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. Neither shall the flames kindle upon you. The Lord has promised to protect you if you will simply stand up, take that first step, and face your bullies with courage. The Lord has promised to protect you in Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 17 it says no weapon that is formed against you shall stand and every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment you will condemn this is the heritage of the servants of God and your heritage as well as a soldier of the cross the Lord has promised to enable you Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says that you can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. Finally, the Lord has promised to give you victory if you will stand up and fight. In Romans chapter 8 it says, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For the Lord has prepared us for a showdown with any and all of the bullies that we face every day. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. So the bullies that we face, the things that we encounter that can make us afraid, that can paralyze us with fear, are also opportunities for the glory of God to have a victory within you 